I told you we could just stand up here and you could say squid over and over again and they'd still love you. It was true. Good afternoon, lovely yes. humans. Thank you all for being here with us today. Um, before Diane and I get started with speaking, we wanted to take the opportunity to thank the amazing group who uh, brought this year's uh, Eurocamp together and brought us all here together this weekend as well. So thank you guys very much. We really appreciate everything that you've done, and this has been a phenomenal event. Thank you. Thank you very much. So tonight we want to talk to you about cultivating empathy, about building bridges, like the bridge we, you can see over here. Because um, as well, Leslie as well as me, uh, though separately, but uh, we had the same experience in experiences, unfortunately, in companies and uh, communities where empathy was not uh, a high priority. And that usually leads to miscommunication, holding grudges, and in the worst place even to contributors burning out and just leaving the whole project. So we're hoping that our remarks here today serve as uh, useful tools for everyone in the audience to uh, understand the value of empathy, to cultivate it within themselves and their organizations with the final goal being to make our projects, companies, and ourselves uh, better and stronger. And that's us. So, oh, what's, oh no, let's reopen it. No worries, we can deal I, with I, that. I can sing if you want. I, I don't Dance your name, please. Dance my name. Oh, that's <laughs> of the I'm gray just fortress, just waterfall. <laughs> we're on again, we're on again. Woo! Woo! I love her exactly for that. <laughs> so, this wonderful human being is Leslie Hawthorne. You saw her yesterday at another talk. Uh, she has been doing open source uh, work in the open source community for over a decade. You don't see it, but uh, yeah. Uh, and in her past projects were, amongst others, the Google Summer of Code. And uh, she was the creator of Google Coden. Right now, she's living a happy life as an expat in Amsterdam, but of course, she loves Berlin even better. That's actually completely true, and I hope to be moving to join all of you very soon. Um, obviously, given the round of applause earlier, Diana needs absolutely no introduction whatsoever, uh, but just to recap, uh, she's a past organizer for Eurocamp, a past organizer of the Rails Girls Berlin workshop, and uh, she's also a member of the board of Ruby Berlin. So. This year for the conference, she decided to take a break and to just give a talk, which is uh, probably just a little bit scarier. Uh, not at all. <clears throat> no, not at all. Uh, so why empathy matters? Um, first of all, it is important that we actually define empathy. So empathy is the process of actually being able to feel internally uh, what another person is feeling. And this is to distinguish empathy from sympathy, whereas sympathy is the ability to feel something on another person's behalf, like, I regret that your laptop broke. But it's not the same as, as feeling that same moment of terror when you realize that Keynote has just decided to barf while you're giving the closing talk of the conference. Um, and empathy is vital to us because it helps us to be much more effective in everything we do. Empathy helps us to build better products because we can understand our users' needs and what they will do with software that we may have created for ourselves. It helps us to work more effectively in our teams because it helps us to understand everyone's motivations and what they need to get out of our interactions in order to be successful. And basically, everything is a question of empathizing effectively because it is through empathy that we are able to create harmony. Yeah, so you're feeling into the other person, but it's also about you too, right? You have to know your feelings. How do you react in different um, situations? And 
how do you understand and uh, act differently while you are amongst our p the peers? So how you probably react differently here at this conference than you would do or I would do at a board meeting or uh, talking to a customer, right? So empathy helps you to enlighten yourself and to learn natural self-interest. And I think that the other important point that we'd also like to make, too, is we're going to talk a lot in this talk about uh, the value of exercising empathy in terms of how it's received by other people. But it's also very much about you, the individual. By practicing empathy, you're going to be a better negotiator. You're going to be able to get things done more effectively because people like to work with people who they know have their best interests at heart, right? Much more so than they like to work with people who Maybe not so much with that. Uh, so uh, getting started in our empathy process. So empathy is actually a choice. Uh, and the two studies that I'll reference on this slide are uh, documented in a New York Times article from July 10th, 2015 called, believe it or not, empathy is actually a choice. So it's very easy to find. Um, so two of the studies that stood out in this article to me were one, individuals will frequently choose to avoid situations in which they think that they will be forced to have an empathetic reaction. So for example, choosing not to visit a country as a tourist where you know you will encounter high rates of poverty because this will cause you to feel bad and uncomfortable. So that's a little bit of a bummer, um, but again, it demonstrates to us that empathy is a choice. It is something that we can choose to do. And when we understand that empathy is a choice and the value of it, we are much more likely, therefore, to exercise empathy. Um, another study uh, found that folks who were primed with the idea that empathy was a choice, that it was something that they could cultivate, that it was accessible to them, uh, were much more effectively able to feel empathy and often sought out the opportunity to do so. Uh, in this specific case, the researchers were determining if people who were taught that empathy was a learned skill would be more willing to think about and empathize with the experience of folks who were races other than their own. And there was a very positive correlation there. So again, empathy is a choice and it is your choice. And hopefully today we will convince you that it's a choice you want to make. Yeah, you were talking about empathy as a choice. So as surprising as it is, it is nothing that you are born with. You ha you're born with maybe a bit of empathy, but it comes through socialization, through your parents, through interacting with other people. And for that, you have to be reflective. How do I be, how could I be reflective? What is that? It's actually thinking about how you react, what I said earlier, how, I, how do I react? So take your time every day and take care of yourself, of your mental health, of your health in itself. And for um, being a better uh, empathizer, to, to increase your empathy, take the time, write down different situations that you were in and write down, how did I react there? What did I feel? How did the other person react? What did I do? And over a time of days, weeks, months, you will find a certain pattern of yourself, who you are, and how you react in, in special situations. You can improve yourself when you, when you are in another situation that is similar to one that you were in, in two, we uh, two weeks before, and you wrote down, I should have done this and that differently, I should have done this and that like this, then you can just think, oh, I had this two weeks ago, and now I try something different, and let's see how the outcome, uh, com how the outcome is then there, right? And ask questions. Learn how other people see things. Widen, broaden your own world, your own bubble that you're in. So empathy is often built throughout um, adversity. So if you're trying very, very hard to learn, imagine why something is very, very hard to learn. 
that seems to be like this for somebody else, right? I have a, I have a little bit of an example. Last year, we had a, t a speaker here, Austin Serafin. Austin is blind since birth, right? West birth, I think so, yeah. And uh, he, uh, he found this app for his iPhone that can show him the colors or that can tell him the colors of things. And he was so excited about it. He downloaded the app, he opened the app, and he tried it out. And all it says was black, black, black. And he was like, that cannot be right. Something is, something is not right. And then he was trying to step out of the, out of the box and think out of his bubble and think how seeing people might solve this problem. And at one point he thought, oh wait, colors may be only seen with light. So he went and switched on the light, <laughs> I used the app, and suddenly it was yellow, purple, pink, blue. There we go. Step out of your comfort zone, step out of your box, out of your bubble, however you want to, tell, uh, to, to say to that, and there you go. You will eventually find a different answer. So getting into our skills building portion of this presentation, um, one of the ways that you can begin to cultivate empathy is through the practice of active listening. So active listening is the process of engaging in dialogue with another individual or with a group and when someone has spoken, to take the opportunity before replying to first mirror what they have said back to them. And so summarize it in your own words and then add your commentary at the end. So for example, wow, I, I'm, really, I'm really nervous. Um, I'm not great at public speaking, so I'm really excited that we're giving the closing talk at Eurocamp today, but I'm, I'm a little freaked out. Well, Leslie, really, I can, I can imagine that you're really, really excited about being here and that you're a bit, um, a bit nervous about being here, but, but about giving the talk. Sorry, I'm a bit... Um, but and that's no problem at all. I know that you're great. I saw a lot of talks and, well, if you're nervous now, that means that you're, that you're prepared, that you're thinking everything through. So you will be awesome. Thank you for this wonderful demo. <coughs> So uh, the practice of active listening is a key component in nonviolent communication. And the reason for the creation of the practice of nonviolent communication is to assist us to overcome all the ways in which we are socialized or culturally taught to uh, just step over compassion for other people. Um, I, it, is just, it is a natural human tendency to practice selective hearing, to only hear what we want to hear, or to quote one of my favorite movies, to just stand there, not listening, waiting for our turn to talk. So instead of doing that, if we actually slow ourselves down and take the time to mirror what the other person has said to us, we not only are able to absorb what they're saying, to internalize it, to feel it, we're also giving them the opportunity to correct us. Maybe we didn't really understand what they had to say. And then they can give us the opportunity to come to better understanding by saying, actually, that's not what I meant at all. Here is what I meant. Skill building exercise number two, because this one's funsies. Read fiction. Um, this is one of my favorite exercises to do, regardless of empathy. So uh, a recent journal that was pub uh, published in the uh, PLOS Journal, and I should know how to expand that acronym, but that's okay. It's in the footnotes. Uh, it's uh, a journal of open science. Uh, a bunch of researchers discovered that the act of reading fiction helps to create empathy within the reader. And it is through a process called emotional transportation. The idea that you are able to put yourself into the position of the characters within the story to feel what it is that they feel through the process of reading and imagining the story taking place. And for those of you who may feel like it's, it's a little weird to uh, go through thought exercises thinking like, what would Diana feel in this situation? How would she react? I mean, admittedly, it's a little weird. She's my friend, right? I don't, I don't want to be like, hey, can I get in your brain? It's nice in there. 
Um, so again, reading fiction and going through this process of emotional transportation is the first step in doing thought exercises like that. It's a very comfortable, familiar way to begin exercising empathy with the characters from the page. And then we can apply that to our process of real life. I'm a bit curious right now. Um, how many of you do read fiction? All right, keep your hands up. How many of you have been very, very sad when the book ends? All right, almost all the hands stayed up. Yeah, I've got, I've got the same, because you, you, are, you are absorbed in a new world with new characters, with new people, with new, I don't know, aliens, whatever, uh, unicorns, love it. And then suddenly, the world is just poof away. And it's that sadness that, that tells us that we have experienced the act of emotional transportation, right? Otherwise, it would not be impactful to us emotionally that the story has concluded. Yeah. And speaking of curious, embrace your inner child. Be curious. Ask questions. By asking questions, that also implies avoid assumptions. Again, a talk from last year. I don't remember everything of the talk, but I remember as especially one slide when I was I had to restrain myself not to jump up and say, hell yeah, because it said, assumptions are evil. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Laura is over there. Thank you, Laura, for that. <laughs> and I will give you a little example of that. For example, I'm standing here minding my own business and I can see a person over there, or over there, I don't know, doesn't care, uh, looking like this all the time in my direction. And I'm, I'm confused because the person looks like me like... And I, I'm, I'm getting nervous. And I now can assume, oh my God, I did something wrong. I, maybe I have the wrong clothes, I don't know. Maybe, maybe the person doesn't like black, I, I don't know. Um, and I could go in my head and I can build a whole castle of assumptions and they will build and build and build. What I also could do is like just walking over. Um, Sorry, I recognize that you're looking a bit um, worried or angry at me. Did I do something wrong or am I under the wrong impression? I'm, I'm a bit confused right now. Oh my God, no, I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I, I was deep in thought. I have this problem and I just cannot really, I, I don't know, I cannot get it. And I was just thinking and I'm, I, I didn't really look. It was just that my head was in this direction, right? Ask questions. Questions are our friends. And our best friends ever are open questions. Whom of you do know the difference between open and closed questions? Good. Very good. For those who didn't uh, raise their arm, open questions are W questions. Open questions are questions that open the people where, when, what, why. Where do you go to holiday? Oh, the Bahamas. Oh, why do you go to the holidays? Oh, I read this magazine, blah, 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 blah. And what will you do there? Oh, I wasn't thinking, but I think I'm blah, 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 blah. So, these are the open questions. Then there are the closed questions when you're in a hurry. Like, what do you, uh, do you want pizza to, for, for, for dinner? Yes. Do you like spinach? No. So open, <laughs> open questions are mainly questions that, are, are, that can be answered with yes, no, or yeah. <laughs> so uh, closed questions, sorry, closed questions are this. And so just to recap, open questions are our friends. So now we're going to shift into talking more about how we can have effective organizations that help us to cultivate empathy. Um, obviously, organizations are made up of individuals, but in the way we create the culture of our organizations, our teams, and our projects, we can encourage the cultivation of empathy. 
Um, so I think first and foremost, very important, um, is to be explicit about our values and to be inclusive in creating those values. Um, I had another example, but I threw it away immediately when I saw the signs on the bathroom doors here, which are so freaking cool. I think I might steal one and send it to a friend of mine who I, I know needs it. So uh, the signs that say, um, if you are concerned about the gender of a person who is entering the bathroom, take these steps. Don't worry about it. They know better than you. That is phenomenal, right? It is explicit, right? Transphobia is not okay here, and it is inclusive. Transphobia is not okay here. That is phenomenal. Um, and it's extremely important to be explicit about your values because otherwise people make assumptions about what is important to the organization, to the group, to the team, right? You need to be very clear what your values are. And I know this is gonna sound kind of corny because let's face it, most of the time mission statements are crap, but mission statements are very important, right? And this isn't the kind of silly mission statement that you read we will make the best ever chocolate chip cookies by using only the freshest ingredients. <laughs> that means nothing, right? Absolutely nothing. But here, a, a very useful and good example. Uh, if folks look at ThoughtWorks' website, and they actually have a page where they talk about the pillars of their company, the things that their company values, and one of these is social justice. And they talk about how one of the objectives of their organization the pillars around which they build their company, will be to do work that creates more justice in the world for those who are underrepresented, or those who have fewer resources, those who have, are less able to help themselves. And by making this an explicit statement, what they're doing is they're not only telling the entire world, this is what is important to us, they're also giving their employees Right, and the knowledge that this is one of the ways in which we will conduct ourselves. This is how we will conduct a business. This is an expectation for each of us as we go throughout our daily affairs at work that we are to do work that is transformative in the world and makes the world a better place for everyone. And another point to that, that um, is, can be seen especially in the tech scene, is globalization. Globalization means that people come into a company from very, very different backgrounds. They grew up in very different countries, under very different political um, backgrounds and stuff like this. And things that are, that are totally normal for you in your daily life, or for you, or for you, might not be normal for the new person that comes into your company, into your team, into your project. And this comes to assumptions, right? Absolutely. Uh, another thing that is useful to understand as well when creating organizations, creating culture for those organizations, uh, this is where uh, leaders come in uh, and play a very important role, an impactful role, right, by leading by example. Uh, one great instance of this is my friend Erica Joy Baker, who has been uh, blogging frequently about uh, diversity in the technology industry. Uh, she wrote a, an article called The Other Side of Diversity about her consideration of ending her employment with Google, which is actually where I met her. Uh, and she realized that she needed to move on, but she wanted to go to a workplace where the work she did mattered, and she knew that the people that she worked with valued the same things that she did. And she talked about uh, reading Twitter and seeing all of the various news about the protests going on in Ferguson, Missouri after the murder of a young black man by police officers. And she noted a deafening silence from most of the people that she knew who worked in the technology industry. Uh, she noticed a deafening silence from leaders in the technology industry. No one seemed to care. This was not their problem. This took place far away by people of a different socioeconomic class and a different race. Not my issue, I don't care. But by contrast, the CEO of Slack, a brand new quote unquote unicorn startup with a valuation of over a billion dollars. Y'all don't have oh, billion. Oh, it's Bill, uh, Thank you. Um, <laughs> 
valued at over a billion dollars, was tweeting his concern for the protesters and that he hoped that they would be safe in their pursuit of social justice. And by reading this, she realized that this was the company that she wanted to work for, that this was the place where she should bring her talents to bear. And she's now one of their release engineers. And having worked beside Erica, I can tell you that um, any company is, is very lucky to have her. So again, be explicit about your values, be inclusive, and make sure that everyone is on the same page about what is important to all of you for you to be successful. Oh my god, we have hippos. They're there. cute. They're what a little the grumpy. What do they do there? What's okay, that? so hippos are cute, but these hippos are grumpy, and there is a reason, and that's because these hippos are letting you know to discourage hippoing. Hippoing is highest paid person's opinion is the only one that matters. Yes. So only the one on the level that begins with a C matters. CEO, CTO, C whatever. So make sure that every voice is heard in your company, in your project, in wherever you are, wherever you gather people that have to decide something. Um, I tell you a little story, because that makes it more clear. In my day-to-day -day life, I organize IT conferences. I organize them with a team that is very good. Like, we, when we communicate, it's like a circle of communication. So we are circling around all the ideas that we have, and we are playing with them. We do brainstorming sessions and stuff like this. And for one conference, there came a new person in. And this new person got grumpier and grumpier all the time with every email. And I was a li little bit like, what's going on there? And at one point, I was there. I don't understand your emails anymore. I, they're, they don't seem very constructive. What's going on there? And this person was just like, you're not a good manager. You cannot even make simple decisions. You cannot, uh, you cannot decide if we want the speaker or not. Why do you always have to ask us? I was like, whoa, that is interesting. Then I thought, uh, OK, this person came from a big company where the manager said, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. You have to be finished with this by the end of the week, and stuff like this, right? And I said, OK, we're working here differently. We are working as a team. Yes, I am the manager of this project. So I have to make sure that everyone is on track and that we are at the uh, point where we have to be finished, that we are finished and everything is set. But on the road, everybody has a voice. I don't know everything. I'm not going to all the conferences in the world. I don't know every speaker in the world. But you might know him, or you might know him. For our, at one point, we had, I, I read an abstract that was so perfect, and I thought, oh my god, I want to have this person at my, a conference because this just looks perfect for this or that or that. And then I brought this in, this abstract, and said, hey, look at this abstract, this is amazing, look at this, it would fit there. And, we, and then there were three voices, three, that said, nope, nope, nope. You know what? They saw the speaker at another conference, actually at two other conferences. He were mean, he was racist, and he was very, very not nice. <laughs> so I said, oh my god, I'm so happy that I asked you. We will not have this speaker at our conferences. Definitely not. So. If you are the hippo, if you are on the sea level, make sure to be inclusive, to let everybody have a word. At the end, it is your decision, of course, but you don't know everything. I know you, sometimes we, think, we tend to think that we know everything, but to be honest, no, we don't. And that's why asking questions and talking to people is very important. So again, important for all individuals 
within an organization, um, but a, a cultural value to promote. Do not flip the bozo bit. Uh, for people who are not familiar with the uh, idiomatic phrase, don't flip the bozo bit, uh, this is actually from a book written in 1995 by a gentleman named Jim McCarthy called Dynamics of Software Development. And the idea of flipping the bozo bit is that once someone says something or does something that you think is stupid, every statement that that person makes from then on is wrong. Everything they say is put on slash ignore, and you have no value to provide to me, to the company. I just don't have to listen to a word you say. Mine, just one time, right? One time they did wrong. So flipping the bozo bit is, is not useful for a wide variety of reasons, but let's just start with the basics. Uh, if there is someone in your organization and you have decided that they are never going to say anything useful, you've also decided that they are never going to be successful. And then at that point, you are better off not having them there because they should go someplace where they can be successful and contribute to the success of that organization. And you can have another human being there doing work that you will actually appreciate. Now, mind you, I suggest that the problem is with you in that scenario, not with this individual. Um, there's also the point that this is just, it's silly, right? This is ridiculous. We're all human beings. We all make mistakes. There is no reason to decide that one silly mistake defines a person forever, right? And if you make the decision to flip the bozo bit, you are cutting yourself off from the opportunity to ever learn something from that person again, right? That is not wise. And finally, organizations where this is common practice are encouraging a lack of innovation and stagnation and a lack of creativity. Because if people are afraid that if they say the wrong thing, that they will be judged, that they will no longer be respected, what will they do? They will choose to say nothing. They will choose to not contribute. Yep. They will choose to not engage because they are afraid. Yep. So being inclusive also means make it truly OK to fail. At the end, yes, we are all human. Humans make mistakes. Surprise. And through mistakes, mistakes are actually good, because through mistakes, we learn. We learn that something is not good. It's not good to leave your trash on the floor, because another person might trip. So you can actually rewind what you did and do something else instead. And also, do not oppress people for making mistakes. It happens all the time. And when you find out that a person made a mistake or the person comes to you and says, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, talk to them immediately. Because otherwise, it will probably, it's, it's, it's like the, 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 assumption, the assumption thing that goes in your head, and it's building up, and it's building up, and it's building up. Uh, that is the same with, with uh, problems. When you have a problem and you're not talking about it, it will probably grow bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And at one point, this whole Vulcan of problem will explode, and you will probably sometimes say things that are not nice, that are not inclusive, and that might burn the bridges that we are trying to build up. So my friends, our talk is at an end. Uh, and so to just quickly recap what we've discussed today, um, empathy is a choice and a learnable skill. And we can cultivate it through active listening, reading fiction. How's that for homework? Something you want to do anyway. Yes. Uh, getting to know yourself and being more self-aware practicing curiosity, and avoiding assumptions. And within our organizations, we can be explicit and inclusive in our value systems, avoid hippoing. Hippos belong in the wilds, not in our offices. Uh, not flipping the bozo bit and ensuring that it is truly OK to fail. And to quote um, or to conclude our talk with a quote from Rumi, Always be kind for everyone, 
is fighting a hard battle that you will not see. Thank you very much. Yes, we love you. Questions? Yeah, what a fitting closing talk to this conference. That was amazing. Uh, and it really shows that uh, in a, in a very innovative format as well, that the, the whole <laughs> is greater than the sum of the parts. Two speakers uh, together are better than uh, individuals. So. We love it. It's true. <laughs> amazing. So yeah, we can take a few questions if there are any. Is there a girl equivalent for bromance? I don't know. Is there a girl equi it's equivalent to bromance? Sorry, we have a question. <laughs> That's us. <laughs> anyway, yeah, question. Okay, um, not really a question, but I'd like to add to that because I absolutely agree with what you've said and thank, thank you. you for everything you've said. Um, but whether you follow this advice or not may uh, well decide about the future of your project or your company because I spent a couple of months in a company where uh, the C person uh, did quite the opposite and bullied people, never forgave or forgot the slightest mistake. And uh, a lot of really good, uh, knowledgeable people left, left the company. Yes, that's, that's what happens. That was, that's what happens. People are leaving uh, unhealthy environments. Yeah. I've actually talked on this topic a few times. Oh, it's for the video. We need the. Oh, it's for the video. I've actually talked on this topic a few times, and people have said, "So, so, what do you? What can you do to change an organization where people are bullying or hippoing or, you know, just generally not being empathetic?" And I have racked my brain for the last year, and the answer is always the same: prepare your CV and tell your friends that you're leaving. Questions. What? We're out of ice cream, I like. There's a question. Um, what do you think for you personally has been the most uh, challenging or exciting thing that you learned that you have shared with us here? Oh, wow. Okay, um, I, I, have, I have something about the learning to be empathy thing. It's a process. Do not expect you to wake up tomorrow like, today I will be empathetic. Mm, that's not how it works. And we all, we are all humans, there we are again. We all have bad days and um, at some point, even I, I, I tried so hard and so hard and so hard and at one point I just flip out because somebody is pushing my button and I'm just like, Oh my God, I told you this like 10 times. Uh, probably not the best answer. <laughs> so I think for me, the most profound thing that I have learned is actually the process of active listening. Uh, because I speak really, really fast, I have a tendency to interrupt, which is not awesome, and I'm constantly working on it. And I also think I know what people are talking about, because I'm super <laughs> smart. And the answer to that question is no. No, 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 no. Um, so actually getting trained in active listening and being able to, to go through that process and because at first it sounds a little silly like, yeah, yeah, you're listening. Um, why are you summarizing stuff? This is annoying. But, but realizing how much closer it brings you to someone because uh, human communication is flawed and difficult and we just think it's easy because we can talk. So clearly communication is easy. There are words coming out of my mouth right now. Um, and it's not, right? And, and active listening teaches us you know, that it's not easy and that it is a, a skill that we acquire and something that we have to work on every day to be effective. And if you never practice it, the first time or the first few times that you will practice it, it will feel totally silly. You, you will feel yes. like an idiot. And it's okay. Just, it's okay. Just push through. It will all get better. More? Again, there we go. <laughs> Anyone else? You get another one then. Um, I, I'm just really interested because I hear these concepts in Buddhism a lot as well. In like, oh yeah. <laughs> is that an area that you look in for inspiration, or 
what are the main are other areas that you um, look at? Oh, I thought this was about our religious affiliation. I was about to say, you know. <laughs> For a moment there, I thought this was about our religious affiliations, and I was about to say dirt-worshipping tree-hugging pagan. Um, so let's see. Uh, I, I take inspiration from literature written by, from folks in various walks of faith. Um, I read a lot of psychology journals. Um, I read a lot of fiction. Um, and I don't know. I think I just have learned partially to be a more empathetic person because sometimes things were really tough for me. Um, when I was younger, I was bullied in school, and it taught me, like, I don't ever want someone to feel as bad as I feel right now. Uh, and because of that, it, it helped me to be a more empathetic person, right, to value, to value bringing joy and love to someone's life instead of pain and not ever wanting to be the person who was the source of pain for another person because I knew how bad it felt myself. What she said. We were separated at birth. Don't tell anyone. Are there nice humans? Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs>